Um, welcome to this uh, July installment of the Zymedica Technology Forum. I'm Tuni Shartner. I'm the Executive Director of District Hall Venture Cafe Providence, and we're very excited to be um, hosting this event in partnership with Zymedica and Nemec. Um, since most of you on this know, uh, Zymedica started this monthly program uh, in 2014 as an internal monthly information sharing platform to inform the employees about the newest medical related technologies in the public domain with the intent to spur creative ideas and innovative thinking in their work. As a company that partners with leading medical device, pharmaceutical and diagnostics companies to design, develop and manufacture solutions for the healthcare market, innovation is at the core of everything Zymedica does. District Hall Providence opened in August, 2019 to support startups, innovators, small businesses by providing them with a free and open workspace, meeting and event spaces and engaging free programming that supports entrepreneurship and innovation, including our signature Venture Cafe Thursday gatherings. Uh, which is running right now simultaneously to this program. We've pivoted to provide our community with virtual programming throughout the week, including the programming partnership with Zymedica and Nemec, which is one of our favorites of the month. Uh, welcome to this event. Before we get started, I'd like you to meet our partners. I can hand it over to Mark with Zymedica. Thanks, Ginny. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just uh, two quick things from me. Uh, just a, an introduction of who Zymedica is, but also why we do these forums. Um, but you know, basically our mission at Zymedica is to partner with clients to bring um, advanced healthcare technologies and devices to the market faster than anybody else. We have a, a product development process that's not just nimble, but it has the rigor and discipline required by the FDA. But crucially, it allows us to take our clients' ideas and concepts and bring them through this, this process um, to commercialization with speed and cost efficiently. Uh, we've been doing this for over 30 years and coupled with just the sheer volume and variety of projects we've completed. Uh, these experiences have, have resulted in capabilities and competencies that we offer our clients um, and really that have made us the leader in this space. Now, why this forum? Well, we understand the need to be highly familiar with all of the evolving technologies and gadgets and innovations that have come into the public domain. And these monthly forums uh, provide an effective way of of, co of collectively sharing and, and discussing these developments. And they've got the potential to spark ideas and projects that we're working on. Um, you know, this innovation can then be passed on through uh, to our clients and in turn to the healthcare sector as a whole. So we hope you enjoy this as much as we do. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it back to Juni. Thank you. Fantastic. I don't know if um, Danielle has been able to join us um, from Zymetic. I mean, Nemec, are you there? Danielle? Yeah. Okay, perfect. You want to say a few words yeah. about it? Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Um, if I don't know you, and I know I think a lot of people on today, I'm Danielle Sherman, I'm the marketing team manager for the New England Medical Innovation Center, otherwise known as NEMIC, and we are one of the partners um, on the technology forum today. We are a medtech venture studio located in Providence, um, and we support medtech startups from all over the world to develop their businesses, to care for fundraising, and successfully bring their medtech ideas forward. Um, so I just ask if anyone here has an idea they're working on um, and needs help really, you know, rounding out their business and raising fundraising, you know, begin working um, with a product developer like Zymedica or um, developing their product to reach out to me today. And I'm looking forward to um, Jessica presenting the rest of the forum. We want to remind you that this is a monthly uh, event program and August 20th is our next. So we look forward to seeing you then. I'm going to hand it over to you, Jessica. Oh, thanks. I'm going to jump right in. Assuming that I can make my uh, screen move forward. So we cover a whole bunch of different categories categories on a monthly basis. If there's a particular category that you would like to be able to insert, please flag it and we'll do our best to kind of start to speak to it. Um, the, this series of categories have been built up over the years that we've been doing this and we find that this is kind of where our particular interests lie, of course, um, in uh, coming from med techs, uh, the med tech space. We did add a COVID-19 section um, for obvious reasons in the past few months. We've seen a lot of innovation, particularly in that space. So uh, we'll incorporate that. So I'm jumping right in, in terms of materials first. Um, if you have ever been involved in the storage of blood, you know what a challenge it is. 
um, in terms of maintaining a, a good inventory that is still fresh and able to be used. It, uh, typically human blood lasts for about six weeks and it needs to be kept uh, refrigerated through that period of time, which is particularly challenging in uh, kind of harder, uh, more developing countries. There's a new process though that essentially, as the title here explains, um, is drying blood for long-term room temperature storage. And it involves placing red blood cell cells in a spiral-shaped uh, microfluidic channel. And then these bubbles, very small bubbles of inert gases, which, in which include trahala trahalanose, and I always stumble over the long, the long more complex names, um, which is a biocompatible sugar um, that's used to um, create different versions of live virus vaccines. So it kind of does a little bit of the kind of the, the base platform of what uh, freeze drying blood uh, would look like. Um, is also added into that bubble mix. And as those bubbles move through the blood, um, they, they're pulsed. And so that creates this ability for the bubbles to pop and then allow for small pores um, in the blood cell outer membranes uh, to open up. And that's a process called sonoporation. And in, in that opening up of those blood cells, uh, the charcoal mole molecules can then can insert themselves into the blood. And then uh, the process of freeze drying can actually uh, enable, uh, can, can be enabled. Um, and interestingly enough, that, that blood can be rehydrated with deionized, deionized water to become a viable blood again. Pretty cool, and it has massive implications for um, how we um, uh, build up a blood, blood supply. The next material, um, and we often feature uh, 3D printing technologies here. Um, there's been uh, there've been quite a few in the, in in the last ten or so years, um, but this uh, what we're starting to see is much kind of more interesting kind of evolutions of what 3D printing is uh, entailed. Um, Amelia uh, Mottet, who is one of our um, uh, design assurance folks in out of Minnesota uh, flagged this one for us. I believe this is her alma mater, University of Minnesota. Um, what this particular research team has figured out is how to dynamically 3D print on an organ uh, to enable electronic sensors to uh, be able to uh, be placed whilst that organ is moving and expanding and contracting. So the team started with a kind of balloon-like surface um, and they use motion capture tracking markers, similar to what we see how movies are developed, particularly for special animation, special effects. Um, that 3D printer then adjusts its printing path to that dynamic surface. Um, and then they, this team also then was able to uh, replicate the process on an artificially inflated animal lung, which is what we see here in this visual. Um, and they expect to then uh, now trial the process on a pumping heart. Um, and so you can imagine this might entail some form of medications or therapies applied to kind of heart patches um, and uh, uh, ways to help the heart continue pumping in terms of uh, a capability in the future. Pretty, pretty interesting. Another 3D printing also in vivo is now being planned by a combination between the Taraski Institute, which is based out in California, Ohio State and Penn State. This is a bio ink that allows for 3D parts to be printed inside the body in real time. It's got a, it's a fluid ink um, and it's a dispense from the tip of a robot a nozzle that's surgically inserted into the body um, via a small incision. Uh, the nozzle punches a small kind of space into the internal soft tissue and then builds a series of anch anchoring blobs, technical term, uh, to create this, or as we see on the image here, lattice-like structure. Um, the ink can be applied at a normal body temperature and then, then can be cured with a non-UV light source. Um, and they expect to, obviously, for, you know, clear, clear relevant applications might be a patch for a damaged organ. Um, and they're also considering uh, using this to repair hernias um, that have been damaged. Staying in the heart space, uh, a polymeric transcatheter valve by polyvascular Sheila uh, Trovek, um, who is in our pharmaceutical division um, or sector, found this one for us. This is a congenital heart, so congenital heart disease is a birth defect. Um, and uh, it is a tremendous cause for infant mortality. And so this particular company have figured out a transcatheter valve that can stay with the child as they grow. Um, and they've made this valve available both in pediatric and adult sizes, but the valve, because it has the ability to expand as the child grows, that child doesn't have to go back in for repeated open heart surgeries over time. Um, the valve is made, from a bio, uh, is made from a biological tissue, typically, um, but the immune system has challenges with kind of accepting uh, that, uh, that, that, that tissue and it, it ends up destroying over time. And so this particular polymetric um, 
uh, material is uh, enabling for a longer, longer life of the valve in place. They're seeking VC funding in order to take it to the next level. And of course, there are always overlaps in terms of these categories. So this is where we transition into a material that's also a sensor that's also potentially a diagnostic. We've featured um, previous indicators um, um, on various different materials and produce in particular. Um, this particular indicator sensor is um, a time temperature indicator um, that it, it, when placed on packaging, particularly of you know, things like fish as seen in the, the, the couple that are uh, showing their, their goods here or potentially even medications. This uh, thin flexible sticker has a polymer, poly, polymer nanofiber surface film that makes it appear opaque but then when the film reaches a certain temperature of at least 50 degrees for a very specified amount of time that can be um, adjusted based on the layers uh, that are built into the, uh, the polymers, the fibers ultimately will melt uh, once it's uh, reached that specification and then the structure collapses, turning the film into something that's more transparent. If the stick is brought back into a colder temperature, the, the film is basically done and so it will remain clear. Um, and uh, the cost that they're anticipating this, uh, this product will be able to achieve is one cent. So it could really actually have a very meaningful difference um, in terms of packaging and tracking um, of products that we need to keep at uh, certain temperatures uh, for safety reasons. This next material in the sensor, I've seen a whole bunch of articles about uh, this particular technology. David Dallastagino, sorry, David, I always mush your name. Um, he's a UI designer in, in, um, in California for us. Um, this is a paper pencil bioelectric wearable. So take all the electronic uh, wearables that you've kind of seen in the past and your know, sensors that you know, kind of measure various different components of your body that you have to attach with adhesive. This is just paper and pencil. Of course, it's a very special pencil with a very high uh, graphite core. Um, but what they found, this particular uh, team from Missouri, have found that uh, this graphite core of a pencil can actually conduct significant uh, energy when it's actually used to write. And then that graphite can act as a sensing electrode to create a medical wearable on the paper to monitor someone's temperature or even glucose in real time. Pretty darn cool and really simple and really, really cost effective, you can imagine. Staying in the universe of uh, sensors on our skin, uh, this is uh, a electronic textile conformable suit, um, not sweet, by MIT. Um, and it's essentially a polyester shirt, which that takes us back probably to the 70s and 80s. But the polyester shirt starts at a base of integrating electronic sensors into the fabric. Um, that can monitor various different um, biometrics and uh, the stretchable material allows for a, a pretty tight fit based on the image there on the far, far right hand side but also the material allows for wicking the way of sweat. Um, the sensors have a, a flexible um, strip as you can see on the image in the, main, um, in the main photograph and they're covered with epoxy that can be woven into the shirt um, and that epoxy allows for machine washability which is also something that you'd want for an article of clothing. The sensors can be removed from the fabric and attached to another clothing as well. And there's a kind of a puck, if you will, um, that collects the data from all the various different sensors on the garment. And that's sent uh, to, that can be sent to a smartphone to be able to read and understand uh, the information. Um, another sensor that's also a diagnostic is super, super small. So this is the size of a one of one cent or one penny um, that's been expanded. And you can see the sensor there in the middle. This is a lung heart super sensor coming out of Georgia Tech. So our heart and particularly our lungs um, have very faint, subtle vibrations. Um, and the, those can be detected and um, also reveal very key health insights. So they think, this particular team thinks that a sensor just worn on top of the clothing could monitor um, the rhythms of the heart, uh, look at blood flow signals, um, even mimic an electrocardiogram um, just by um, listening to vibrations. Uh, the sensor has two very fine layers of silicon um, with a narrow space in between. And those uh, silicon layers act as electrodes um, to form a mini voltage that moves in response to the different sounds and vibrations in the body. And then those can be detected uh, to um, kind of inform based on kind of baselines uh, to uh, understand if there's a malfunction in heart valve or even a cancer growth in lungs. It's that kind of level of fidelity. Um, so really pretty amazing. 
Um, this next sensor device um, is a catheter-based uh, monitoring system by uh, Cloud Cath. Sheila also found this one for us. She actually sent me one article, so she gets credit for a whole bunch of them that had um, uh, 20, 20 medical startups uh, that you need to know about. Um, and we'd actually featured about 11 of them in previous tech forums, which is always very validating for me. But this one was a, a new one. So this is a passive remote monitoring system that analyzes catheter drainage fluid and is able to detect detect deviations in real time to alert uh, a healthcare provider um, who is monitoring that particular patient. It has built an LTE, so it doesn't need to be tagged into a, a Wi-Fi system. And uh, their fo first focus of, in terms of a patient population is end-stage renal disease, um, and particularly those folks who are using peritoneal dialysis at home. Um, and they run into a whole bunch of problems with uh, their catheters, and the catheters can be um, often uh, uh, have, have challenges in terms of uh, promoting infection rates. And so um, the longer a patient can stay on peritoneal dialysis and not have to move to the more extreme version of hemodialysis where you're exchanging essentially blood, um, the better and everyone is happier. This next uh, diagnostic sensor device is called Alpha Stroke Systems by Forest Device. She also <laughs> saw this one in, in the same article. This is a portable system designed to assist uh, EMS crew first responders in correctly triaging stroke to get people to the right hospital. Um, and they've already partnered with uh, the, one of the Canadian health systems, Alberta, to improve healthcare delivery. What this device does is it provides an alternate to a physical and very subjective exam that the EMS crew um, would do. Um, and uh, because of the challenges with, those, uh, with that physical exam, um, which often leads to an incorrect diagnosis and therefore delayed treatment, um, what is involved with this is that the patient wear, puts on this kind of cap uh, like device on their head and there's physical tapping of stimuli on particular areas of the body and the device is measuring how well that stimulus is, is registered in the brain to then correlate to uh, there, there being uh, uh, um, evidence of a stroke in the brain. And this particular company won uh, a, a competition last year for, as uh, best of uh, med tech innovation. Another diagnostic, and there's actually two very similar products back to back here. Uh, the first one is Think Labs One, um, which comes out of California, I believe. This is an electronic stethoscope and claims to be the smallest, most powerful stethoscope that offers 100 times amplification compared to a standard acoustic one. It has a head jack. Um, it uses a, hand, a head jack and works with even Bluetooth transmitters um, so that you can uh, use it essentially without having to actually uh, touch the patient. Um, and it beams an asculation, ascultation sounds uh, from the patient to a doctor's headphones. Um, so that enables the doctor and the patient to be socially distant, useful in COVID land. Um, and, the, and the doctor can advise verbally uh, the patient on where to position the puck on the body uh, to get a good reading. Uh, there's an app that also displays digital waveforms of the sound and it's commercially available today. Very similar product. Often you see uh, a PR release from one and then an, a, 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 a company that's uh, working on something similar wants to be in the same space, getting the same level of PR from a patent landscape, landscape and protection issue from an IP. This particular product is one of those. Uh, Jan Zakowski, uh, one of our dear, uh, <laughs> digital uh, health folks, is uh, tagged this one for us. This is also an electronic stethoscope that also has maybe more features than the previous one. Also is able to function as a phonocardiograph as well as an electrocardiograph, all in the one device. Um, to allow for advanced uh, cardiac evaluations at point of care. It has built-in noise cancellation. It's able to capture, record, replay, and visualize high-fidelity heart sounds, as well as ECG waveforms on uh, a paired uh, mobile app, uh, uh, mobile iPad or a tablet of, of some kind to help for detection of cardiac abnormalities. And uh, they've been pretty substantial in their research so far in terms of validation work. They've um, already used it in a clinical study of 50,000 children in India, and they've got an FDA approval. All right, moving into robotics. Um, there's always a few kind of 
crazy things that are out there in the robotic space. Um, this one is a little bit on the odd side for me. This is a mobile cleaning device 4.0, which suggests that there were previous uh, generations uh, or iterations of this coming out of the, uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Um, this is designed to clean spaces, um, first initially and planned for food production, but you can also imagine it being very useful in healthcare settings. Um, there are two different robots. The first one is used to clean a conveyor belt and all the equipment inside of a conveyor belt and it essentially rides on the production line cleaning the equipment from the inside and the other has powered wheels and extendable arm and it can navigate a room identify objects and avoid uh, obstacles using uh, built-in radar and radio sensors both robots have the ability to attach to a hose that supplies the water and cleaning so, so essentially soaps um, which are expelled in a foam format which I can imagine gets really quite messy. They don't actually mention how you meant to clean up the foam. Maybe it just dissipates. I'm not very clear on this yet. Um, but this robot essentially is able to shine an ultraviolet light on surfaces to determine how much fat or oils or proteins um, are there based on fluorescent feedback um, of that ultraviolet light on, on those um, germs and uh, or bio burden and then those uh the an optical center built into the robot is able to detect that and determine what level of cleaning force used of foam amount of foam um, concentration of foam is needed in order to uh, properly clean that surface um, for those of us who still like our trucks and our toys, <laughs> this one is for you. This is a firefighting robot, and how cool is this? Um, it also delivers foam, like the previous product, um, and it's intended to help firefighters uh, enter very dangerous spaces that have particularly toxic fumes um, and enable for remote control. <laughs> this really is a uh, you know, uh, little boy or little girl's you know, biggest dream to be able to control one of these things. So it has on it an onboard thermal and infrared video camera, as well as gas and chemical sensors. And it can carry a lot of weight and pull a lot of equipment like a foam or water tank, um, even heavy fire hoses or tethered drones to get a better view or overview of a fire. And it has the ability to be airdropped into a wildfire out, uh, outside and is able to dimense, uh, dispense an immense amount of water and foam per minute um, that you can imagine could really have an impact on a fire. Commercially available today. Um, the next sensor device also gets us into the, uh, the UI space. Um, this is called Wireality by Carnegie Mellon. And it's attempting to um, enable better haptic um, connections between what you're, what you're seeing in a kind of virtual space. Um, and this is a challenge that a lot of companies are trying to explore. Um, this one is a kind of a little bit interesting in terms of the methodology that they've adopted. It's just essentially a puppet style glove that stops the user's fingers in their three dimensional space when they're touching a virtual object. So in this case, um, the public, New York Public Library, uh, a lion that's sitting outside, um, you're seeing in your, in, in your virtual goggles. What this does is it essentially is a a pack that lives on the shoulder of the user and has these um, wires that run out that, that are retractable that run out to the wristband, uh, the palm and each uh, pad of each finger. And when your hand comes to the virtual object, um, uh, the, 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 the wires essentially stop. And so you get a sense of where you are in time and space in, in the virtual world. So be able to, you can feel resistance and you can feel the surface shape apparently. Um, they've, it, they're exploring how to make this uh, technology work around things like a large pole, so you can maybe wrap your hand around them, or even irregular uh, surfaces. Um, another diagnostic um, sensor product is the Mouth Lab by Ada Health. Sheila's article also tracked this one for us. This is a non-invasive handheld tricorder device that's able to measure a multitude of different health parameters in a very short amount of time, 60 seconds. Um, it's intended for at-home use, it connects to a cloud, and uh, an AR software identifies analysis anal analyzes and predicts health status and disease progression. Um, so potentially you could be connected to a, a physician through a tri triage surveillance dashboard um, for proactive intervention on your particular disease that you're, you're monitoring. And they're seeking FDA approval as well. This UI diagnostic device um, is to essentially keep 
uh, folks who are um, have braces or orthodontic work, um, having them come into the uh, orthodontist office less um, by enabling for um, monitoring of their mouth from at home. Um, this is a product called Dental Monitoring by a company of the same name out of France. Um, and of course, you know, this is super relevant in the COVID world where we don't want to have to necessarily go into medical um, facilities as much. So how it works is a, a smartphone is set up to attach to this device and it enables for a checkup to happen without an in-person clinic. So the patient receives a dental retractor and this scan box. The retractor is placed in the mouth that exposes all the teeth and the scan box then uh, attaches to a smartphone and then attaches to the retractor. And an audio uh, cues guide the patient on how to properly take the photographs uh, needed at various different angles and then upload them to uh, send to the dentist for analysis or orthodontist for analysis and then the orthodontist when they can when they view them can be alerted to any particular issues and then schedule that in-person appointment if need be. All right, um, diagnostics in the context of imaging. Um, so x-rays, we need them because we need to understand you know, what's happening in our bodies, but um, they are, we want to try and minimize their use because uh, we want to avoid as much uh, radiation, or as least amount of radiation as possible. But this new technology uses a different type of uh, x-ray um, uh, technique um, that maybe potentially has the ability to reduce um, the radiation exposure. So CT, CT scanners, fluoroscopes, and mam mammography uh, machines um, deal with a great deal of ionizing uh, radiation because uh, essentially they're using silicon-based detectors. Um, and they're pretty inefficient when it, when it comes to uh, the deployment of those x-rays. So this new x-ray detector uses this material uh, made from calcium titanium oxide uh, as a mineral and it's a hundred times more sensitive so it allows for imaging systems to use a lower level of radiation to deliver a much higher level of fidelity at a lower cost lower risk to everybody involved in potentially exposure to it all right for those who are um, interested in this kind of thing uh, beware if you are um, taking THC products and considering driving. There is now an ability to check uh, your THC levels uh, with a roadside cannabis test. Bummer, right? Um, so this is a disposal, it has a disposable test strip and a compact portable reader device uh, that can easily fit into a policeman's smartphone. Each uh, strip has two electrodes that are coated with proteins that bind with THC. And when a drop of saliva is applied to the strip, the strip is placed in the reader and electronic current is applied. Um, the current, uh, the electrical current uh, is increased based on how much of the compound is present um, and provide a metric of um, impairment levels. The Xenoscope by Xenocore is a diagnostic and a therapy at the same time. It's a five millimeter, which is a really hard thing to achieve. We're working on a product that is in this kind of space. Um, it has a 90 degree articulating lap laparoscope um, and it's disposable, um, which is also a, a golden nugget that a lot of companies have been trying to uh, deal with because these scopes are really difficult to clean and uh, they're pretty labor intensive and therefore costly in terms of uh, the sterilization reprocessing uh, system. So this has been indicated for diagnostic and therapeutics for abdominal and thoracic surgical procedures, um, including OBGYN, I believe. And this is a disposable scope that reduces the procedure downtime and also enables for a consistent image quality. The device provides a high def picture and also has an anti-fog system embedded in it to keep the clear uh, the view clear. That's also something that uh, has been a, a high, high want um, uh, in the robotic space, uh, anti-fogging. Uh, it has an HD monitor and uh, display device integration, as well as an integrated light and focus controller to make sure you've got good imaging um, coming out of the use of the device. Also in the context of imaging, this is a machine vision image guided system, which is what the MVIGS system uh, is, stands for that acronym, uses a camera based technology and algorithms to precisely define uh, the area of the brain and image the brain and for use for brain and spinal surgery. Um, the 
they anticipate with the use of this device the entire workflow of patient registration, which can be really quite burdensome. It can be about 30 minutes to register properly a patient's anatomy and kind of define where you really want to be uh, locked in on in order to uh, maybe engage a robot. Um, they've, they've been able to, with this, uh, with their new imaging system, to break that. 30 minute time down to less than 20 seconds. So that can be really meaningful in terms of OR time and all the staff that are waiting uh, for uh, that registration to be completed. The company's cranial biopsy kit gives a, a neurosurgeon the ability to target very precisely brain lesions uh, using a, a needle biopsy uh, procedures and they got an FDA approval for that. The SAFE uh, Reboa from New Rescue um, also came from the same article that Sheila flagged for me. This is an emergency use cardiovascular device. Um, this is uh, the first computer aided aortic occlusion balloon catheter. It's quite a mouthful. Um, it's designed to be used in uh, CPR or critical bleeding cases. And since you, so you, you insert the catheter, um, you get it to where you want to essentially minimize the internal bleeding. You open up that balloon to stop the blood flow. Um, the intention is for this device to be used in the femoral artery um, to occlude the aorta and, aorta and therefore allow for blood to be redistributed over the body um, and enable a chest compression so the heart and brain to be more effective because you've got a little bit more time to work with. It's got an intelligent safety feedback uh, a component within uh, the design of the system so, uh, so that the user knows that they have not put the probe in a, a wrong vessel um, that would essentially uh, be a high risk to the patient. They're in development, um, trying to get FDA approval in the near future. This next uh, therapy, therapy device called the EV pacing system by Attical Medical um, from the same article from Sheila. This is a very new way of, of, of delivering pacing of the heart. Um, that doesn't require the placement of hardware or wiring in into the patient's heart. The procedure uses a custom delivery tool that looks a little bit like a, I don't know, maybe a, a gun of some kind that avoids the need for fluoroscopy. It's used at the bedside and can be completed in a matter of five minutes. Um, it uses a power sternal, so through the sternum approach, uh, to deliver extra, extra vascular temporary pacing um, eliminating um, complexity, cost, and risk, and they are, they've completed already some of their initial clinical um, evaluations. Another therapy device called the CDX01 from Candescent Biomedical is a non-invasive energy patch that's designed to help people who sweat profusely um, by inactivating the active sweat ducts and sweat glands. Um, this technology is based on the principle that when alkali met metals come in contact with water energy, um, with water, energy is generated. And so by controlling the amount of metal and water at, at, uh, at the particular site of the sweat gland, um, targeted energy that can then be delivered at the site um, to essentially deactivate that sweat gland. I think it's a permanent solution. Um, so uh, maybe something that you might see in a, uh, um, a, a plastic surgery's uh, surgeon's office um, with the goal of 2021 commercialization. So Tableau hemodialysis is, uh, this particular technology is one that we featured about three, four years ago. They finally got themselves um, FDA approval with a 510K. This is a dialysis clinic on wheels and it's intended to help reduce the cost of dialysis as well as the complexity of it. It only needs an electrical outlet and tap water to function because the whole system is able to purify water and, and has uh, dialysate, dialysate products um, built into the system. There's a touch screen that guides the user through the setup and treatment and automated self-cleaning steps. Um, I would have loved to have been part of the usability of this one, but this, uh, this new FDA approval enables the system for you to be used at home, um, which is a big win for those uh, folks um, who otherwise would be investing hours and hours of time at a dialysis clinic. Other drug delivery products, uh, the Bigfoot Unity Diabetes Management Program by Bigfoot Medical. Um, this is a insulin dependent, um, uh, it's trying to help those folks who are insulin dependent diabetics um, to help them with better management of their blood glucose and calculate insulin dosing levels. 
Um, so currently, most uh, the, of those diabetics who are using insulin have to work with multiple dose injection systems, you know, pens that you're kind of dialing based on how much uh, glucose levels you have. And if you do it incorrectly, thinking maybe for uh, the more cognitively challenged like the elderly or maybe children, um, it can end up in some pretty significant uh, critical situations in terms of hypo or hyperglycemia events. So this system essentially integrates an app with a pen cap, a pen needle and a glucose sensing technology and it uses an algorithm to predict glucose levels and then calculate the insulin doses in real time so there's less burden on the user. There's a monthly subscription package that um, that uh, collects all of the different components of the system and provides that to the uh, to the user um, by mail. And they're planning to get uh, their FDA uh, paperwork together by the uh, end of this year. Another drug delivery um, coming out of MIT. This is a living drug factory. So pancreate isolate cells in our bodies produce insulin. Um, in a workable pancreas. Um, and the transplant of these cells, there's been a lot of work around this, um, this area of idea of transplanting those cells into a healthy patient um, to help with trying to see if that would help with the um, regular monitoring of insulin injections. But the problem is when you transplant these pancreatic islet cells, the body doesn't always accept them. And they, in fact, they often, the immune system often rejects them. So MIT scientists have found a way of essentially encapsulating the cells in a, essentially a device that is protected by silicone um, and elas uh, elastomer. And it has a porous membrane that allows for nutrients and oxygen and insulin to move freely through, its, uh, through the membrane, but keep out attacking immune cells. And they've done some studies in mice to um, find that uh, this particular uh, approach can help maintain um, good blood glucose levels for more than 10 weeks, which is very promising. They're looking to try and encapsulate um, a secreting drug cell approach that might be used to treat other chronic diseases in the body um, at the site of that particular location uh, to minimize uh, the impact of drugs being spread around the body. Very, very promising. Um, this is a patch, we've featured many patches in the past, but this is a patch that holds live vaccines basically, um, developed by University of Pittsburgh. Um, microneedle arrays in patches are able to deliver vaccines into the body highly effectively and uh, virtually pain-free. So it's a really good methodology for delivering drugs. Um, this particular team from Pittsburgh have um, figured out a patch that can carry uh, live viral vectors um, as, well as, uh, as well as their kind of accompanying compounds to, to, that will help boost a vaccine's effectiveness even further. The patch has about 400 needles in it um, that are made themselves, the needles are made from sugar that have been mixed with these viral vectors. And of course, pressing this on the skin because they're so, so very small, these needles feels just like touching a piece of Velcro. So a lot less painful than one of those big scary needles that the doctor will come at you with. But once it's pushed through the upper skin layer, the, needle, the sugar needles dissolve and then release the uh, vaccine compounds that are uh, embedded within them. The patch is really easy to manufacture and it's easy to integrate with other vectors and can be stored for a long period of time, kind of like that freeze-dried blood that we were talking about earlier. Another patch, but this one now for plants, also developed by MIT, is uh, designed to help deliver um, pesticides directly into a plant's vascular systems. Plants need patches too, right? Um, so this approach is intended, is thought to be more effective than just spraying a solution onto the leaves that will then ultimately, uh, hopefully absorb that solution. This is patch is of course less fiddly and, and not as harmful to the, uh, to the plant. Um, it uses a hydrophilic silk to attract water. Plants have less water than human bodies and so it's more dependent on there being water present. And they've tested uh, the viability of this by using fluorescence in the patch and seeing how it moves um, visually through a tobacco or tom tomato plant moving from the roots to the leaves um, and sh so showing the impact of, uh, of the, um, the drug that's been delivered. And they anticipate using this patch to deliver potentially micronutrients or genes for genetically uh, modified crops. They do also anticipate that these patches could be applied by a robot in a field um, in terms of agriculture. So uh, pretty remarkable in terms of its uh, potential there. All right, moving into the COVID world, um, high lab COVID-19 test.
uh, by a company in Brazil has developed a portable connected lab that's able to instant instant instantaneously detect infectious diseases through a non-invasive blood test, a finger stick. Um, the kit produces a result in 15 minutes, uh, which is much shorter than some of the other tests that are out there now. And uh, this company have uh, found a pretty interested market in the Brazilian, uh, in the country of Brazil, for obvious reasons. They're, they've got a bit of a larger crisis than many other countries at the moment. Um, and the consumer price for the test is actually pretty interesting as a, as a price point too. It's estimated that uh, being able to uh, manufacture it at, at, at least under 25 bucks per test commercially available, at least in Brazil. Um, this portable pathogen detector by University of Illinois here in the Chicagoland area is a lab on a chip device that provides for detection of a wider range of pathogens, both bacteria and viruses. And it could potentially, it was initially designed to help with di diagnosing illnesses in horses. <laughs> they, they can produce the results in about 30 minutes and it costs 50 bucks to manufacture. It's a small cartridge that holds the reagents and an import port to press onto a sample. It attaches to a smartphone and it uses fluorescent dyes uh, in the cartridge that bind to the RNA um, that is present in the blood sample. Cloud computing provides uh, the uh, oversight to allow for a neg negative test result to be registered uh, um, to uh, the relevant clinician. And they're anticipating because of the speed and the cost of this, that it potentially would be most useful for airlines when you're checking in to a, into the airport and getting your boarding pass between that period of time and when you have to board the flight, you potentially could go through the use of this um, and be in ensure that you are COVID free potentially. Also event organizers and patients quarantined at home that have to uh, regularly prove their COVID status. This might be useful for them too. Another COVID product of the C100 system is uh, using a radar to sense for respiratory rates, um, identify patterns and complications in a patient located up to four feet away. So wireless uh, monitoring and um, the various different technologies are doing this, but the fact that they're using radar is kind of the most interesting component of this. So respiratory failure in particular is something that has to be monitored manually um, by counting the breaths per minute. Um, and of course, respiratory failure is an early sign of distress for COVID patients. This device can do that without uh, the nurse being uh, uh, physically present. And then obviously the nurse can be uh, alerted um, if there is a complication. There are a couple of mask products um, that have been coming into the public domain. This one is kind of really interesting to me. This is an electronic fabric um, that's built into a face mask. Uh, why, you might say? Well, when you start to think about face masks, to me, they're kind of like dirty handkerchiefs. And particularly when you see people like hanging them up on their uh, the, 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 the rear view mirror and we're just dangling and thinking about all those germs wafting around. Not good. Anyway, so pathogens that are deposited on the exterior of these fabrics uh, of our face masks over time just tend to kind of sit there and it's just a great way themselves for face masks to be a spreader of COVID, not to make anybody even more anxious. So this particular face mask uses electroceutical fabric um, commercialized by a company called Vermaras or Vermaris um, for the treatment of wounds. Electricity in a wound bed can actually help promote uh, faster healing of a wound. So this fabric has an array of tiny batteries that work together to create an electrical field. When moisture is present, a current is generated that disrupts the pathogens from binding together. And then that's shown to kill a, a coronavirus in particular within one minute. I'm not sure about the idea of electronics directly on my face where there is moisture, but the idea that there could be a very active, proactive uh, fabric that is killing uh, viruses when it comes in contact is, is very interesting. All right, uh, the next mask does a very different thing, which is, um, to essentially amplify the challenges of wearing a uh, ampl uh, make up for the challenges of wearing a face mask. Um, it is able to, so it works over the top of an existing face mask, mask that you would wear. And it has the ability to record conversations, amplify a voice for those who are hard of hearing, make phone calls and transcribe speech from text. It's even able to convert Japanese, developed by a Japanese company, go figure, into eight different languages. 
And uh, so obviously it's going to enhance communication. They went through to crowdfunding to raise money and they generated $260,000 in 37 minutes. Um, and for those people who signed up, they're going to get one by September this year for just 40 bucks. I would have signed up for this if I had known that this, would, uh, this was available. In the context of the face masks that we have today um, and all of those pathogens I was mentioning um, that live on them, um, this particular university have developed a sterilizer uh, that works with UVC to uh, clean face masks. Um, basically it speaks for itself inside the unit are two UVC bulbs that stretch across the chamber and a conveyor belt um, pulls the masks that are hung on one end across uh, the UV light so that each mask is uh, radiated and they've gone into using the system in at Mount Sinai for pilot testing. Um, B. Braun, which is well known for its um, infusion pumps, has uh, collaborated uh, in terms of kind of mushed together two different products, their infusion pump with nebulizer um, to uh, deliver uh, um, uh, medications that are, 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 are put available through a nebulizer to patients suffering from uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, one of the outcomes of COVID. So the FDA have granted Be Born a temporary authorization for using this method to essentially um, administer continuous nebulized med medications to um, COVID-19 patients. There have been a whole bunch of ventilators that have been um, explored as America has been involved in a couple of them, uh, from, to my knowledge. Uh, NASA is one of the teams that have uh, uh, gotten inspired to uh, uh, join, join the throng, if you will, with their ventilator intervention technology, Accessibly Local, which stands for VITAL. Um, they've developed this inexpensive, high pressure, easy to build ventilator in just 37 days uh, with collaborating with the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a subsidiary of NASA. Um, the design uh, passed a critical uh, trial at Mount Sinai, previous, <coughs> see previous uh, 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 technology, technology entry. Um, the design uses few parts, and the, fewer parts than a traditional ventilator, so it's essentially easier to replace those parts uh, because they've, uh, they've sourced them from uh, commercial, uh, easy to find commercial sources. Um, the kind of negative thing is that its service life, service life is only up to four months. Um, they made the design available for free through Caltech and they're seeking private medical firms to handle the manufacturing of this. Um, the next vent related product is the vent multiplexer coming out of Yale. This is a disposable 3D de device. It's just this component of, the uh, of what we're looking at on the, on the page. And it's intended to wake, make a single ventilator be able to be worked for two patients simultaneously. Um, even though those two patients have different lung capacities and different ventilator setting requirements, which is um, an important di distinction. Because um, uh, otherwise you'd have to pair up two patients that are very similar and those folks are hard to find in terms of their, um, their various different kind of uh, uh, their metrics and, and, ha and what they need in terms of care. So this device connects to a ventilator and contains four one-way valves to control the airflow in the circuit and the, those valves can be adjusted manually to different settings and it can be installed in minutes and to be made for 250 bucks. Um, this is a very advanced air purifier um, by Molecule and it's designed to pu purify clinical environments such as ORs and ICUs um, and it's essentially uh, purifying air in terms of oxidizing, oxidizing pathogens <clears throat> at a 99.999% reduction in the RNA of a virus within 24 hours um, and the device has already been used in Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, in hospitals there. Okay, this is my favorite category every time, the heart category. There's always a few of random kind of, okay, <laughs> this might be considered an innovation, but really it's, this is, this, there's always a few that are quite delightful. So this one is a Fitbit for chickens. Chickens have their own health issues, um, particularly one of their nemeses are, are mites. Mites attach to the bird's skin and feed on their blood that creates itchy lesions, which of course is very distressing to the chicken. And uh, uh, particularly hens who are laying their eggs, you know, lay less because they're super distracted by those mites. So this is a backpack, a Fitbit for the chickens to monitor their chicken-like chicken behavior, including grooming habits like their self-pecking and their preening and their bathing. 
and using an algorithm to diagnose the presence of mites. And if that chicken is preening more and trying to peck more at themselves, um, that farmer gets alerted and can uh, and start a mite prevention treatment. This product, I don't understand its use. It's called the Noramaki. It's named after a sushi roll, um, the Noramaki Synthesizer by an innovator coming out of um, Meiji a University in Japan. This is a lickable rod that allows you to enjoy various flavors without having to actually consume the food that you would associate with that flavor. It has five gel no nodules that are made of different electrolytes that emit a primary taste sensation like salt, sour, bittersweet, and umami. And so when the rod is turned on, it delivers controlled amounts of each taste of the tongue to simulate specific flavors. I'd just much rather eat the stuff rather than to lick a gel if I don't really see the application of this. But if someone can figure out why they might need this, um, let me know. I'd be uh, delighted to know. Um, so the last one, uh, NASA uh, has another technology that they're trying to develop, which is a better loo um, for, or better toilet uh, for outer space. Um, and they send out these challenges, I medicals participated in one in the past, um, for uh, kind of uh, more public input on uh, finding a, a better solution. So NASA's planning a trip to the moon uh, in 2024. Um, and they're planning to use that trip to the moon, in case you didn't know, to be a launching point for our missions to Mars. Um, so this initiative is grown, helping mankind go where no woman or man has gone before. Uh, the, this is the, so the current space toilet, which is the image on the left-hand side, doesn't, it's not really that appealing. It's a, um, it only works with weightlessness, so they have to be out in space rather than having landed uh, and have any kind of level of gravity. And it's not that efficient, apparently. So NASA's specs for this next gen, if you're considering contributing a submission, you have to do that by August 17th. Um, NASA's specs is that the, uh, this Luna Lu should be a smaller size and able to work both in micro, um, so no gravity and lunar gravity. And of course, there are power consumption and noise level restrictions, but it also needs to accommodate both men and women. And there's a bonus point who wanted to <laughs> design that capture vomits without requiring the crew to put their head in the toilet. So it's a legitimate thing. It, so it, it deserves it deserves a place in the in the tech forum, but it definitely is one of the the more curious. All right, that's it for uh, for this month. I know we've gone over a few minutes. Um, Dimedica keeps uh, all of our archive of these tech forums um, available and we tap into them from time to time for various different uh, projects and ideations and share with clients. So if you are interested in mining that archive, do let us know. And as Tuni said at the beginning, our next plan for next forum is the 20th of August. Thank you so much, Jessica.